This episode of Dear Culture Podcast is brought to you by the all-new Honda HRV. Every creator is driven by a strong sense of curiosity, and the 2023 HRV is ready for any path that the power of determination can lead to. With sleek exterior styling and a spacious interior, this SUV is a statement piece made to keep up with the pace of your dynamic lifestyle. The all-new Honda HRV. Learn more at the best looking HRV ever.com. For Air Force Two. And uh, I was going through the cabinets, and this is when I knew that we had uh, uh, a Black First family. There was packets of grape Kool Aid in the cabinet. <laughs> so I had to take a package of grape Kool Aid off of Air Force Two. And bring it home, dog. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for, by, and about black culture. And we are blessed today to be joined by a celebrity, a special guest, somebody that all of us know from the Blackish universe. But I got to be honest with you, brother. I go all the way back to Z-Boy in the movie Trippin'. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. So we are joined today by Anthony Anderson. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, bro. I'm doing great. You go back to Z Boy, man. G's tripping. Yeah, that was that was in the beginning. Yeah, one of my favorite movies, like ever. I I still I watch that movie every. I own the DVD. I <laughs> okay. When my kids are age appropriate, I'll let them watch it. That look that that that, that has an all star cast: Donald Faison, myself, Dion Richmond, D'Artagnan, Countess Vaughn. Stony Jackson. Stony Jackson, the uh, great Stony Jackson. Yo, man, yeah, you bring back memories now. <laughs> yeah, man, and uh, you know, we're we're appreciative of, of having you, having some time here with you today. We're gonna talk a little bit about HBCUs and this great film project that you have coming out. Uh, I've seen the trailer; it looks to be amazing. I uh, can't wait to talk about that. But you know, congratulations are in order to you. Uh, you recently finished. At the Mecca, Howard University, finished that degree. Uh, you know how we say in the black community, you finished summa cum laude, or thank you, Lottie, but you finished, right? <laughs> I went to Morehouse, so I'm a, I went to Morehouse, so, you know, I understand that journey. My wife went to Howard, so, you know, I have some sympathies for y'all. Like, um, you know, congratulations, but I have to ask, I've never heard this story. How did you end up at Howard in the first place? You know, my... Uh my senior year, my English teacher, uh, Ms. Gail Spann, who I'm still friends with to this day, uh, suggested that uh, I go to Howard. Uh, and Howard was actually the only university that I applied to. You really? Know, growing up in Compton, living in L.A., uh, graduating from Hollywood Performing Arts Magnet School, um, I, I, I applied and got accepted to the theater program. And, uh, you know, started my journey back in 1988, you know, alongside Carl Payne, Wendy Raquel Robinson, Wendy Davis, Puff, Taraji P. Henson, uh, and, and uh, countless others. Um, and so that, that, that's how it all began for me, man. And, you know, unfortunately, had to leave after my junior year due to the financial hardship. You know, I couldn't afford school anymore and I couldn't depend on my parents uh, to help me out with tuition, having three younger brothers and sisters at home. Uh, and so I left uh, after my junior year in 1991. And, you know, my son got accepted uh, four years ago. And so I started the narrative that I was inspired to go back uh, to Howard to graduate with my son in 2022. And, and here we are today. Yeah, that's an amazing story. I mean, I, from what I can't tell you how many countless individuals I know who had to leave school at some point for financial reasons. Like that's a, it's a standard issue HBCU story for so many of us. Uh, unfortunately, you know, so thankfully you were able to get back in there and finish, you know, uh, no matter how long it took, no matter when it took, you know, you got back in there. I do have to ask, though, because those years, those early 90s years of Howard are kind of legendary, especially like in hip hop culture, you know, all that stuff mm -hmm. like what was it like being on the yard back in the late 80s, early 90s when when all those people, like you said, were there when the hit like like homecoming was still like the the yeah. Mecca homecoming? Like, what was that like? Words can't even begin to describe what, what that was like, man. I mean, um, I, I, a Friday afternoon on the yard at HU, just a regular Friday. Guy would come through 
and just hang out on the yard and play music. A Tribe Called Quest would come through and just hang out on the yard. Heavy D, you know, uh, later on down the years, Big would, would come through. I mean, and this was just a Friday afternoon, not to, not to mention what was going on uh, during homecoming. Uh, so, it, it, like, like I say, man, it was, words can't begin to describe the energy that was there. I mean, you know, you listen to all the people I just named, Carl Payne, Wendy Robinson, Paula J. Parker, Taraji, myself, Puff, Ananda Lewis, Marlon Wayans, uh, the musical group Shy. you know, imagine all of that creative energy uh, in one place at the same time. And, in, and you look at how everybody have gone off in their respective fields uh, to become, you know, the uh, captains of industry that that we are. Uh, it, it, it's it's truly amazing. So if you can just imagine uh, all of those people, all of that energy, that creative energy, in in this little small little town, the little area, little little section on campus, incubating. Uh, uh, what 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 uh, what was in store for the future? Words words can't begin to explain uh, uh, how that felt, man. You you had to be there. You know, it sounds like it. And I have this romantic ideology of what it was like there during that time, anyway. And everybody I've ever talked to who speaks about their time at Howard, especially during those years. Uh, speaks about it the same way. You know, I went to Morehouse College. I graduated in 2001. So I was on, on campus in the 90s when all these celebrities were, you know, Atlanta turned into the new it place like while I was there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was nothing to see people on, you know, Common would just be sitting in our student center, um, which is crazy because we didn't have a lot in our student center. It's still HBCU in the 90s after all. There wasn't a right. lot there for us. But, um, you know, what is it? So what was it like being back on the yard for your graduation? I mean, it's a completely different neighborhood now has to look, everything has to be completely different than it was when you were there, at least outside of the, the immediate uh, campus. Yeah, yeah, you know, the city has changed. I mean, you know, I got, when I got there, gentrification was starting. Uh, and, you know, 30 years later, you, you see what it's become. Uh, but, but, you know, the campus, the yard, the College of Fine Arts, uh, you know, some things uh, never change, and, and for good reason. Uh, but the energy was beautiful, man. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of full circle moments there. You know, uh, my son being there, unfortunately, he didn't graduate. But my, my son being there, um, the, the dean of the College of Fine Arts is now Dr. Felicia Rashad, who's a friend of mine. The assistant dean uh, to the College of Fine Arts, uh, Denise Saunders Thomas, who was a college classmate of mine. Uh, um, you know, who helped usher me through uh, graduation and helped me matriculate. She's there. Taraji P. Henson, you know, who graduated Howard, was receiving her honorary doctorate and giving the commencement speech. She was my classmate uh, uh, when, when, when I was there back in the 80s. So for us to have all of these full circle moments uh, uh, was, was, was truly amazing. So that, that's what it was like you know, for me being on the yard, you know, 31 years later, you know, and, and being in Burr Gym, you know, walking with my class, my graduating class and classmates, uh, I was just a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I live here in D.C. and my wife's younger brother is now he just completed his freshman year at Howard. So I was moving him out of Drew. Mm -hmm. While I'm listening to the uh, I'm listening to the speech while you all in Burr because it was raining. It's supposed to be yeah, on the yard, but it was raining. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So um, I have to ask. Are, so on Blackish, Dre is a sneakerhead. Are you a sneakerhead in real life? Because I see George, Nike gave you a pair of like got to be one of one Howard University Jordan Air Force Ones. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan Fours. When you're a one of one, all you can receive is a one of one. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. Uh, I, I am a sneakerhead, man. I have about 400 pair uh, of uh, some exclusive things uh, in my closet at home that uh, that some I don't wear, others I do. And when I wear them, they're like, man, why are you wearing those? I was, like, was going to ask, do you wear your shoes? You just collect the shoes. Because I'm a, I'm a sneakerhead, too, and I wear all mine. I, I have to. My wife is so tired of seeing them. I collect them to wear them. That 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 is the reason uh, 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 why I do what I do. 
you know, um, you know, growing up, look, man, growing up in the hood in Compton, coming from nothing, having nothing, you know, that was, um, uh, um, that was status, uh, a way of having status for us, getting new J's. And I, I only earned, earned, I only owned one pair of J's growing up, uh, as a kid, man. And they were given to me by my boy. They were his, uh, high school basketball shoes. And, uh, they, they were purple and white. Uh, Air Force Ones, uh, or white with, 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 with purple trim because he went to the school called Linwood and that, that's where their colors. And, um, you know, he gave them to me after a few wears and that was my first and only pair of J's growing up. And, you know, it, it was our dream. You know, it was like, yo, I gotta have, I gotta have the new J's, whatever they are. Uh, and once I, once I made it, once I started making some money is when I started you know, collecting uh, and, and, and getting them for myself. So, yeah, I have over 400 pair. But I have I have friends. Like, I, I thought I was doing something. I was talking to Shannon Sharp one day. He said, how many pair? I got, I got about 400. He's like, oh, hey, you got to catch up, man. You got to catch up. You know, his, and his number is astonishing. Wow. Yeah, I'm about I'm about 300 myself. I, I have I got shoes in storage. It's my wife really is over my use of space in our house. Like I said, we live in a townhouse in D.C. She's like, bro, this is getting out of hand. You ain't gonna um, tell me look, look, I, I have a house and I have a townhouse. My townhouse is my closet for my shoes and, and my overflow of clothes. That's that, that's that's how that's how serious it is for me. I love it. I love it. Also, I love that you said matriculate because I think that's a, a black college word. We used to harp on that word at Morehouse, our matriculation. And I don't I never heard that word outside of HBCUs, but I love it. I love hearing that. Um, you have this amazing film project that I want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, a Dream Delivered, The Lost Letters of Hawkins Wilson. Um, so for starters, like, tell me about this project and how you got involved. Like, what is it and how did you get involved in this project? Uh, you know, uh, it's a story of the descendants of uh, Hawkins Wilson. Uh, you know, uh, the family just started, you know, building or making their family tree. And they got stuck, like, like all of us do, you know. Uh, I remember growing up, my family tree was the family Bible. And in the family Bible, you know, you have those first couple of pages, you know, grandparents, parents, uh, children. And, you know, I could go, I could only go back to my mother's grandmother. Well, actually, I take that back. My mother's, my mother's mother and my dad's mother. That was it. I can only go back to grandparents. My children were fortunate enough to be able to at least had their great grandparents in, in their lives for a time. And so, you know, it's a story of, you know, this family, you know, trying to put the pieces together to find out, you know, what their lineage is, where they come from, who they come from. And uh, they asked me to be a part of it uh, because I had started my journey as well. He understood the importance of bringing together the branches of your family tree. It's no longer just pieces to the puzzle. They have the puzzle. And uh, to see uh, and to witness, you know, this family go through this process to understand why they were attracted to certain things in life um, and professions and places to live. And, and to find out that, you know, the mother was or is a ordained minister you know, Hawkins is, was an ordained minister uh, in his time. You know, they kept passing through this city, um, you know, where family was and whatnot, not knowing that that is where Hawkins came to settle. And he settled hmm. in the church and was an ordained minister in this church that they would frequent on occasion, not knowing this history. Um, and then, the, you know, the dominoes started to fall. The information... Uh, uh, that uh, they were able to find and, and, and dig up made everything make sense to them and had everything come full circle. So to be a part of that and to witness that and, and to see and experience it uh, for myself uh, uh, was, was worthwhile into itself. And, you know, I hope when an audience watches this that they would go out and do the same thing. You know, in during the process, I found out that uh, or, or I found out that 
my, on my mother's side, we can trace it back to 1857, 1859, you know, the mid 1850s, you know, great, great grandmother, you know, who was possibly enslaved, um, uh, had a piece of land, met a man, uh, started a family, unfortunately, and worked this farm that they didn't own, uh, unfortunately lost her husband, uh, found a new uh, husband, blended their family, owned property, owned their own farm um, and, uh, in, in 1902. And uh, she lost her second husband. But now she's a single mother uh, owning farmland and farming in 1910. Uh, and then, you know, from there, it went on to uh, birth my grandfather's father. Um, and so this is the information that uh, I was able to get. So now I'm able to you know, put these pieces together for my family, you know, and so that, that what, that's what makes it all worthwhile uh, for me to connect the dots because we all have family members that, you know, was oral history for us. Right. You know, my dad came from, he was the youngest of 16 children, you okay. know, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And by the time he was born, he had brothers and sisters that were already out of the house, already in other places living their lives. He had brothers and sisters that he never met, that he only heard of, hmm. you know, that he only saw pictures of. Because of my partnership or my involvement with Ancestry, you know, I can put these pieces, some of these pieces together now. And, and that's what... Uh, uh, this family did, uh, and that's what I'm doing, and hopefully other families, when they watch the film, you know, will do the same thing. You know, it's so interesting. Like, I'm I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you were able to trace your family back. I went to uh, I went to Ghana for the year of the return back in 2019. I was one of, you know, thousands of Americans. We all went back there. My wife is actually originally from Ghana, so we, you know, went to take a trip to go visit her family and stuff, and... You know, I had such a, an emotional response to being there. And I don't I don't know how far back we we haven't traced my family history back right. that far. But just the idea of the potential and the possibility that this is where my family could have come from. Yeah. Like I'm sitting here standing on a beach while there's parties going on behind me. And I'm just looking out into the ocean like, man, maybe this is where my family was before our history was lost. You know, maybe that. And it yeah. was such an emotional thing for me. Um I had to, I had to like remove myself several in several places. I went to go see, you know, the, um, Elmina, like the El slave castles slave and castle. stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and I went to go see all that stuff and it, it just was such a moving thing. And it was, it was kind of painful even being there because it's like, what if, you know, that idea of what if, so I kind of wonder what it's like for you having made these discoveries. Like, what does that even feel like? It's wonderful to be able to give that to your family, but just on a personal level, like, how does it feel to be able to trace your history back to to know what your history is back to a certain point that most people, most of us can't get to or haven't been able to get to yet? You know, it, it's like a sense uh, of completion, you know, having everything come full circle. You know, it, it's interesting that you bring up that I was part of the original group who put uh, the year of the return together. So the, the year you were there. I had to I bow out and I couldn't make it that year. So I was there the year before with Boris Kojo and, and, and his brother Patrick and everybody else. We put that together. Uh, uh, so I'm glad that you were able to make that pilgrimage with, with the group. Um, but I've been on the continent five times, man. Ghana, uh, Elmina Slave Castle, walk through the door of no return, you know, wearing my, my T-shirt that says, I am my ancestors' wildest dream. Uh, you know, and, and it's just a sense of pride uh, to be able to come back, you know, uh, to the motherland, you know, to a place where we were never supposed to come back to. Right. Uh, uh, and, and so doing that, uh, being a part of this, finding out the information that I found out uh, about my family, watching other families do the same thing uh, is, is just... Uh, a, a fulfillment that words can only begin to express. For this film, or Dream Deliver the Lost Letters of Hawkins Wilson, does it 
kind of get into how you can go about even finding records of your family because I wonder if this this is the kind of the thing the kind of thing that might inspire others to try to dig further into their history. Like I I saw the trailer and I guess they discovered these letters that had been written and that that unlocks if if I'm understanding this properly and that kind of unlocks a door into their history and who they are and everything. And I wonder if most people even understand or know where to even start looking for their history and who they are and where they come from. Like, is that part of the story explaining like how you can even go back in and, and start to figure out who you are and where you came from? I hope that's what families take from this. I hope that's what people start to do to uh, take it back further than just big mama. You know what I'm saying? Right. Down south someplace. You know, because sometimes that's all we know. That, that's all we have. Um, but, you know, hopefully people are inspired and, uh, and, 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 see, um, and see how this family uh, feels completed. You know, right. see how, you know, some answers that you, they have had have felt answered. You know, felt uh, resolved. Uh, that that's what it's about, and and I hope that's what families take from it. Yeah, absolutely. I did uh, I did some digging myself, and I got back to uh, just my great great grandfather. Now, my father knows all the people in the family. He know you know their oral history is very strong. But I was able actually I was actually able to find like papers, like death certificates, and things like that. And uh, that's something I don't think they'd ever seen. They never, they'd never seen anything with his handwriting on it or anything like that. And uh, that in and of itself was just kind of like, it's just, it's just amazing how your own personal history can be so emotional, but unlock things for you. Like, man, this is really something that a person that I've never met, but who helped me get to where I am. Like just even the handwriting of somebody, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And um, I'm, I'm really glad you're part of this project and, and glad that projects like this exist. Um, I know Henry Louis Gates is part of it and you know, see, this is his bag, right? Like this is, you know, this is his whole thing, trying to connect people to who they are. But, you know, going, going back, you know, just to touch on something that you said, you know, you, you found uh, uh, death certificates and whatnot. You know, the, the story of Hawkins you know, this, this man was sold at age five or six, and he still remembered his family and with great detail, man. So he went and he couldn't read or write at the time. So he went and, and gave this information to uh, someone who wrote the letter. Uh, 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 at the bureau to get this out to find his family. Um, uh, unfortunately, he was never reconnected with his family. But to see these letters that he now, as a, uh, an adult, ordained minister, and all that, uh, the way he spoke about his family, what he remembered uh, at age five and six. You know, and, and spoke about where his sisters and brothers were and how he spoke about that. He was like, well, they belong to, you know, he's speaking of his siblings as property. Uh, you know, to see those things, to see that letter, those letters uh, from back then. Uh, and to see it come full circle now, even though he never was reunited with his family. Those letters have, you know, re been reunited with his family and is bringing his family together today. That is what's amazing uh, about this project. Well, it sounds amazing. And I, I, I can't wait to check it out myself. The trailer got me inspired to, to know more and learn more. And, uh, you know, we appreciate your contributions there and everything that you're doing to help bring that story to light. Cause these are the kind of stories we need to have more, uh, more shine on. We need to understand how to find out who we are, where we come from, because I mean, it's, it's everything. Like, like you said, it's completion. It's all that. We do this thing called black fashions where we have you tell us something about yourself where, I mean, that most people might not expect to hear from you, right? Like something about your blackness that ends up being a confessional because well, you know, it's just not what we thought we were going to hear. So do you have a black fashion, something that 
about you that would surprise other black people listening to us now? The only thing that I can think of right now, uh, I don't drink Kool-Aid. Ever? Or like now? I haven't drank Kool-Aid in over 20, 25 years. Okay. So that that's fair. And I think that's probably why you're why you're successful, actually. <laughs> you're probably <laughs> healthy enough to still be here so you can actually continue on in 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 life. Because I don't think Kool-Aid households make it too far. I just don't, I don't think they do. And I, um, and, and I never called it cherry or strawberry. It was always red. What flavor you want? I want red. Yeah, though funny, because grape is an actual flavor, but red is also a flavor. I have this debate all the time with people like red is a flavor as far as I'm concerned. It could be cherry, could be strawberry. It could be, uh, what was it, mixed berry, whatever one of the, the, the one that came in the the, uh, the blue pouch. Yeah. Tropical. That was red too. Tropical. There you go. Tropical. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a black fashion I'm proud to hear. I don't drink. I haven't. My children have never had Kool-Aid. Yeah. No. Why? That's why we're diabetes now, Panama. Right, because you when you make Kool Aid, if you want to make a genuine good batch of Kool Aid, you pour you pour sugar first, and then you add the other like you yeah. you pour from your heart. Yeah, and the heart will lead you astray when it comes to making Kool Aid. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm glad you haven't had any Kool Aid. I don't know if we would have got all them seasons of Blackish <laughs> if you had been drinking uh, Kool Aid. And I also will tell you this, man. While the Obamas were in office, I took a USO trip to uh, to Afghanistan, and we flew over on Air Force Two, which was, uh, I believe, the first lady's plane. Did not know there was an Air Force Two, honestly. Yeah, I'd never heard that before. Air Force Two. And uh, I was going through the cabinets, and this is when I knew that we had uh, uh, a black first family. There was packets of grape Kool-Aid in the cabinet. <laughs> so I had to take a package of grape Kool-Aid off of Air Force Two and bring it home, dog. I still have it sitting in my office at home. It's a little small package of uh, grape Kool-Aid that I took off of uh, First Lady Obama's plane, Air Force Two, that I, I, I've been cherishing for, you know, quite some time now. I have never heard of them drinking Kool-Aid. You might have just literally <laughs> dropped like great, a bombshell. Great Kool-Aid on Air Force Two. Oh, that is amazing. Well, look, brother, I, I appreciate you spending some time with us here today at Dear Culture. Thank you for your insights, for the information. Thank you for sharing a bit about your 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 Howard journey. I've, um, I'm always I always love to hear HBCU stories. It's really you know, really near and dear to my own heart. So thank you for sharing that. You got it. And, um, you know, thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you for all the all the roles you've taken that bring joy and, and, and pleasure to the black community and to the community at large. Like, truly a gem, truly a pleasure. Uh, so thank you for all of that. You got it, bro. Yeah, and uh, thank you all for listening to Dear Culture. If you like what you heard, be sure to download the Grio app and listen to more episodes of Dear Culture and more original content from the Grio's Black Podcast Network. Um, email all questions, thoughts, concerns, suggestions, compliments to podcast at thegrio.com. Um, Dear Culture is an original production of the Grio Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. And it's produced by myself and Crystal Grant and edited by Cameron Blackwell. Taji Sr. is our logistic associate producer. And Regina Griffin is our managing editor of podcasts. So for myself, Panama Jackson here, Dear Culture, have a black one. Next week on Dear Culture, a conversation with an independent black filmmaker, Renika McQueen. In my write-up, I made a couple comments like, you've probably never seen this movie. Like, I wasn't I wasn't gracious about me yeah, you presenting. Me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to take that. I'm going to have to take that. 